Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Palacios and I am here to speak to you about an academic subject that is also important in the clinical sciences and biology, even medicine. And these are the differences of eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells, but I'm going to show you real life examples that tend to mostly pertain to medical and clinical uh, correlates. Also, if this is a concept that you're learning either in high school or college, this will be a very good understanding of the major differences. Again, these are the common differences that I found. Uh, every teacher wants you to learn them a little bit different, so make sure you check with them to see how much information is this really pertinent to what your teacher wants you to know. So objectives and goals. Obviously, learn the major differences between eukaryotic cells and prokaryotic cells, which are the two main types of living cells. I'm going to give you in-depth explanations. Uh, it might be more information than you're looking for, but that's gonna also going to help you understand the whys. And I'm going to give you an example from the real world, in this case, the medical or the clinical sciences. Ten different ones that I want to discuss. So, with 10 on top, let's start with number one, which is domain. Domain is a subject in taxonomy, which is the discipline of biology that helps to classify living things according to their genetic information, their similarities to other species, and so on. Um, there are three main domains, and those are the most general living things that you can uh, classify. And those are eukarya, which belongs to the eukaryotic cells. And then the prokaryotic lines are bacteria and archaea. Uh, so archaea, they live in very extreme environments. There is a picture here of a volcano, or thermal, thermal waters that are extremely uh, aggressive so we're not talking like thermal waters where you can just lay and have a good bath instead this one will make you melt your skin and probably everything else they're very extreme temperatures the chem the chemically uh, concentration of hydrogens and other substances are so high that it can it cannot sustain normal life but this type of archaea have a way to adapt and they're considered to be extremes and they live and they are considered prokaryotes. Now, in, compare, in contrast to the bacterium or bacteria in plural, they are universally found everywhere, human environment, even non-human environment. And in the case here, I showed a picture of Klebsiella pneumoniae, which is a type of bacteria that causes infection of the lungs, hence the name pneumonia. In eukaryotic cell lines, we see mostly plant and animal cells. Those are the two most common ones that you'll come across. Uh, plant cells obviously are in all plants that you will encounter. They each have a specific way to process. But that's the differences between a plant and an animal cell is the plant cell has a rigid boundary, a border. And in an animal cell, it tends to be more flabby. It can be shaped a little bit. It's more fluid uh, as the cell itself. Number two, size. So as you may know, or are seeing in this picture, prokaryotes are a lot smaller than eukaryotes. I put the size there. I'm not sure if you need to know the specific size, but we're talking micrometers, and that's 10 to the negative six meters. So it's very, very small. You can only see it in microscopes and even so. And you will, I put a picture here of a macrophage and a macrophage is a type of white blood cell of the innate immune system that helps to combat any foreign pathogen that goes into the body and causes disease or damage, irritation, things like that. So macrophage, you see the size, it's a lot, a lot larger than the bacteria. And what it does is grabs onto the bacteria, brings it to its cell, and then basically engulfs it and eats it up. That process is called phagocytosis. But 
it, that's basically what it is. It just grabs it. It's like Pac-Man. Grabs it, grabs the ghost that's in yellow, and then eats it up. Or the ghost that's in blue with the flashing lights. Number three, cell wall. So in prokaryotes and eukaryotes, they can both have cell walls, but again, it depends on the type of cell. Uh, however, in prokaryotes, in the case of bacteria, because those are the most common prokaryotes that we'll encounter, they do have cell walls. Uh, however, they have a very distinct and complex cell wall compared to the eukaryotes. Here I put two samples of a cell wall, the gram-negative bacteria and the gram-positive bacteria. And in microbiology, you might learn that gram-negative bacteria include Neisseria gonorrhea, and that's a type of sexually transmitted disease that is responsible for, you guessed it, gonorrhea. But you notice that the cell wall of that bacteria is very different from the cell wall of the other bacteria, gram-positive, in this case, Staphylococcus aureus. This type of bacteria is present in our skin in two very uh, minute amounts, very small amounts, but the moment it starts going into your inside of your blood or sometimes your mucous membranes, it can cause disease and can lead to serious, serious complications. And we'll speak a little bit about how specific this bacteria can get. Uh, now, so those are the prokaryote cell wall. Now, the eukaryote cell wall, we talked about animal cell, which they don't have an anim uh, a cell wall, but plants and fungus do. Fungus is like mushroom, basically. If you think about it in a simple way, think of mushrooms. In this case here, we are, I'm putting the picture of Candida albicans, which is a type of uh, fungus that resides in our bodies and when our immune system is decreased like immunodeficiency which is common in individuals who have AIDS like HIV infection and um, people who go through chemotherapy their immune system gets compromised or also the very elderly with a lot of diseases so when those when the immune system doesn't work as well candida albicans tends to be what they call an opportunistic pathogen and it takes over and it starts causing problems in the body so the cell wall is like this it has an outer wall and an inner wall but it is considered a cell wall and then in plants they have a very rigid cell wall that you'll see and it's just made of fibers intertwining with each other kind of like a net to make the rigidity of the wall and they're usually made of cellulose uh, they may they may they may look complex but in comparison to prokaryotes they are not as complex number four flagella or flagella however you like to pronounce it so a flagella is like to call it simply it's the tail of the cell and a bacteria I mean, a prokaryote and a eukaryote, they both have them, but they're different in function and even structure. So the prokaryotic um, flagella is rotatory, which means that it moves in circles. So it goes like this, and it's made of a protein called flagellin, and it's small and narrow. You can see the picture on the bottom to kind of give you an example, but then the eukaryotic flagella tends to be more undulatory. So undulatory just means like moving back and forth in comparison to circles. It is made of a different protein, not flagellin, but it's instead it's called tubulin. And it's also large and thick. So it makes sense, I guess, because eukaryotes are larger in size. So they need, require a thicker flagella and prokaryotes are smaller in size, so they need a smaller flagella. Uh, here's a picture of uh, Listeria monocytogenes, which is a type of gram-positive bacteria, and you can see the extensions around outside of this of the bacteria, and those are the flagella that allows the cell to move in circular motions. And this type of cell infects the intestinal cells, causing diarrhea. 
Uh, and the other one, another cell that can actually cause diarrhea too, is a eukaryotic cell called Giardia lamblia. This is a type of protist cell, which are single cell organisms, and they tend to live in ponds, in unclean waters, and this one specifically can infect the gastrointestinal system and also lead to diarrhea and cramps. Number five, organelles. So, like the name says, organ means like an organ, uh, a tissue, a functional tissue, and then nails is just the word for little. So organelles means little organs. In prokaryotes and eukaryotes, they both have organelles. The difference is that eukaryotes, they are membrane bound, which means that they have a cover around to differentiate within the cell. Whereas prokaryotes, because they're so small, they don't necessarily have that many organelles in the first place. And they just, they're kind of like free floating within the cell. So they don't need to be that complex. So there's a picture of an actual electron microscopy that shows an actual picture of a real cell in both sides. And then number six is ribosomes. So to help you understand what ribosomes are without getting into too much details, it's the house of assemblage. So what that means is like the warehouse where RNA is translated or created into protein or transformed into protein. I mean, the, the, the word is translation, but that's what it does. So it's very, a very essential uh, organelle in the body. Uh, and I'm sorry, the cells per se, but the prokaryote in this case, has a smaller ribosome than the eukaryote. Uh, here is a 70 and 80. Sometimes that's the typical average, but for the most part, the main difference is prokaryotes, ribosomes are smaller, eukaryotic cells, because they're larger, they also have larger ribosomes. And these ribosomes are made of RNA, tRNA specifically. So as a real life example of a doxycycline is if you can think of the Lyme disease and the drug doxycycline. So if you understand Lyme disease is an epidemic, you, especially in the Northeast of the United States, uh, like in Connecticut, Massachusetts, uh, upstate New York, even Pennsylvania too. And it's slowly spreading on the West Coast too. So without getting into much detail, Lyme disease is a type of spirochete that resembles the gram negative cell wall. Uh, and it also has ribosomes and these ribosomes are, you know, they create the proteins to do their function. But doxycycline is a, it's a heavy drug, an antibiotic specifically, that inhibits that process. So it tells the ribosome no more you're not doing this again, or you're not making proteins. So the spirochete ends up not, replica not replicating or end up, or even dying. So that's an example. Number seven is the nucleus. So again, uh, prokaryotes, eukaryotes, they are differentiated. They, they do both have a nuclei. Nuclei is the plural for nucleus but the eukaryote is a lot more organized, is membrane bound, and it also stores DNA inside, only DNA. Whereas the prokaryote has a nucleus, but it's not really a nucleus because there's no membrane bounds. It's kind of like free floating too, but it also contains the genetic information. And instead it's called a nucleoid, which means nucleus-like proper or feature and in the case here I'm showing you a picture of E. coli which is one of the most researched um, bacteria that has led a lot of has a, it has shed a lot of light into how bacteria adapt mechanisms into dealing with diseases and things like that and number nine, number eight 
chromosomes, we're almost there. So chromosomes are what stores your genetic information. And prokaryotes, your eukaryotes, they both require genetic information because they need to pass on to their offspring. So a prokaryotic cell or a bacteria, the prokaryotes is gonna be, it's gonna have a circular chromosome. It's just gonna be like a round, a little circle. It's gonna have plasmids that contain DNA, but they're not part of the nucleus. Instead, they're outside. And I'll get to that in a bit. And then they only have one chromosome. Whereas eukaryotes, they have two or more, depending on the complexity of the species. In the case of humans, we have 46 chromosomes. And eukaryotic cells, they have a linear chromosome. In humans, you will see 23 pairs of chromosomes. So 22 pairs of normal cells uh, and then another pair, pair of the sex cells or the sex chromosomes. They call it the sex chromosomes. So XX determines a female and XY determines a male. Now, when it comes to the plasmids, just to mention a little bit about this because it is actually clinically relevant to a big topic that we encounter in the hospitals today, which is MRSA or it's abbreviated for methicillin resistant staph aureus. Now this type of disease is a type of gram positive bacteria staph aureus that I talked about before or mentioned briefly, but it gains resistance to the antibiotics that they're being used against. And the thing is, is that this code to adapt against this antibiotic is stored in these plasmids, in this genetic information outside of the cell, of the nucleus, sorry. And this information gets transferred to another a bacteria, a neighbor bacteria. And then that neighbor bacteria, when it learns that genetic information, also learns or adapts to create proteins against that specific antibiotic. And that's how bacteria can adapt to work against antibiotics. And this is why MRSA can be a very complicated disease and needs a lot of attention and treatments with different types of antibiotics. Number nine, cell division. So we have prokaryotic cells. They are called binary fission, which basically what it is, is you have the circular chromosome and then it splits into two and then the cell then splits into two and now you have two daughter cells. If you see the picture here of a bacteria that can cause pharyngitis, rheumatic fever, and even skin disease or conditions, uh, it's this one's called Streptococcus pyogenes, and pyogenes means uh, creation of pus, creates pus, because of that's what the infection looks like. So this type of bacteria, as you can see, there's this dashed line that tells where the duplication happens. So from three, you go to six, and then from six, you go to 12, and so on. And this is called binary fission. In eukaryotic cells, they don't have that. Instead, they have something called meiosis and mitosis. And this because these are very complicated, so more complex than prokaryotic division. Again, they're larger, so they need to organize it better. So in mitosis, what it is, is you're basically making the same copy of the cell, like the mother cell and then two daughter cells, they have the exact same genetic information. So that's mitosis. And then meiosis is you start with one mother cell and then you end up with daughter cells with half the genetic information. And those are known as the sex cells. The sex cells like the sperm or the egg in females, they carry half of that information so they can, uh, when mating happens, they combine and then they create a new embryo or a zygote. Uh, and here I put an example of like the intestines, like the, in the small intestines, you have cells called enterocytes. And when they damage, 
they can also repair by mitosis because again these cells are not sex cells so they can repair by the process of mitosis but just be aware that not all cells can go through this type of replication okay so the last one growth rate we're almost there so in prokaryotes you will see that the growth of replication and the, you know growth in general by size and offspring in prokaryotes is a lot shorter than eukaryotes and it makes sense because they are small they don't require that much time and resources to duplicate and grow and you can see here an experiment of putting a lot of cells bacteria cells into you know with the resources to grow and you give them about two days and that's how long they last but eukaryotic cells they are on the slower side and also it depends on the type of tissue like epithelium tissue which is like your skin your intestines that do that replicate very fast it tends to grow back in days but then you have brain tissue like known as the nervous tissue and that can take months before you can see any growth or replication or even so so that is the main difference so we've gone over our top 10 differences between eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells i really hope this was helpful and again if you want to check out more videos please subscribe to the channel check it out and thank you so much and i hope you enjoy this bye bye